Eh, well, uh, ¿Se escucha algo? Ah, ok. okay. Well, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, very, very special edition of our colloquium. Uh, in this occasion, uh, we have uh, the presence of uh, Hills uh, Medal Professor Okunko. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure and an honor to have you here today. Uh, but maybe, maybe uh, you know or not that uh, the visit of Professor Okunko to Buenos Aires uh, has been possible uh, thanks to uh, the Fundación Bunge uh, Ibor. So that uh, I could like to invite uh, Dr. Gerardo de la Paulera to share some work with us. Gracias. Gracias por abrir tres minutitos nada más. Bueno, quiero agradecer a la Costa por, por la invitación. Y eh, esta es la segunda vez que hacemos, digamos, bueno, lo hemos hecho varias veces, pero la segunda vez que estamos en cada premio que entregamos. El, eh, en el día de ayer se entregó, tuvimos el honor de entregar el premio anual de la Fundación Bunkibor en Matemática. Eh, a, al eh, eh, doctor, eh, digamos, Víctor Lojay y al doctor Pablo Schmerkin. Y, eh, digamos, en ese, en ese ámbito queremos cada año eh, tratar de apoyar la llegada de otro científico de la disciplina de estirpe, como el eh, doctor Andrei Okunkov. Eh, en el año pasado, gracias también a Juan Pablo Paz, que está acá, pudimos tener... El, 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 del mismo modo al doctor Serge Jarosch, premio Nobel, digamos, de, de física. Y, y hoy eh, quiero además eh, agradecer al doctor Fernando Rodríguez Villegas, del ICTP de Trieste, que, cono que nos conocemos hace bastante tiempo. Eh, y, y, y realmente para nosotros es un honor eh, estar nuevamente aquí. Les quiero rápidamente, en un minuto y medio, eh, comentar que la Fundación Bungibón eh, tiene más de 55 años de actividad. Yo hice el cálculo porque soy historiador económico cuantitativo. Eh, en esos 55 años, el 92% de sus actividades se dirige para la actividad pública, para el bien público, para los científicos, para la universidad pública, en los distintos ámbitos que hace, digamos, en ciencia y tecnología, en educación. Eh, en salud eh, y en cultura. Eh, y, por, y estamos cambiando el enfoque, estamos empleando eh, un enfoque empírico y matemático para la inversión social, en el caso de Chagas, en el caso utilizamos Big Data para los temas, digamos, del Chagas en el país, armando zonas de riesgo, estamos utilizando un programa STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineer, Arts and Mathematics, para el nivel inicial. Eh, así que estamos muy comprometidos, digamos, y, y, a, y además muy orgullosos con la calidad eh, científica que tiene, eh, digamos, nuestro país. Y, y hacemos muchas cosas, digamos, con eh, la Facultad de Ciencias Exactas y, y, y Naturales. Hemos hecho ahora un acuerdo con la FADU para hacer endógenamente un, un, eh, una, lo que se llaman juegos para jardín de infantes a partir de un equipo interdisciplinario. Así que les quiero agradecer, digamos, eh, a esta casa, a la Gran Universidad de Buenos Aires, de darnos esta oportunidad y le voy a pasar eh, la palabra a, a Fernando para que presente eh, a André. Así que muchas gracias y, y te dejo. Hola. Eh, quizás, como sepan, yo me gradué como licenciado de matemáticas aquí en la facultad. Creo que en esta aula tomé topología y cálculo numérico. No sé si todavía existe. Eh, es un placer enorme estar de vuelta presentando nuestro expositor de hoy, Andrei Okunkov. Eh, como también recordó eh, Jerry, ayer se dio el premio Bungenborg a dos licenciados de matemáticas de esta facultad, Victor Yohai y Pablo Schmerking. Fue realmente un evento extraordinario en todos los sentidos de la palabra. Entre otras cosas, es la primera vez que se da el premio Bunge Born en los cincuenta y tantos años que tiene el premio, que se da en matemáticas. Así que creo que eso es una cosa muy importante. Y la charla de hoy es un poco una continuación analítica de este hecho. 
parte de una celebración de las matemáticas en, la, en y de la Argentina. Yo agradezco eh, profundamente a la Fundación Bukemor por el reconocimiento y que ha, han hecho todo esto posible, y André en particular también por participar en este evento. Eh, aunque André entiende bastante el castellano, les sugiero que conversen con él más tarde si quieren el castellano, y les creo que les va a gustar. Voy a de todas formas pasar a hacer la introducción formal en inglés, porque me resulta un poco extraño que hablar de alguien que no entienda del todo lo que uno está diciendo. Andrei Akunkov was born in Russia and obtained his PhD in mathematics from Moscow State University in 1995 under Alexander Kirillov and Grigory Olshansky. In 2006, as you may know, at the 25th International Congress of Mathematicians in Madrid, he received the Fields Medal for his contributions to bridging probability, representation theory, and algebraic geometry. I quote from an announcement describing his research. Andres has revealed profound new connections between different areas of mathematics and has brought new insights into problems arising in physics. Although his work is difficult to classify because it touches on such a variety of areas, two clear themes are the use uh, of notions of randomness and of classical ideas from representation theory. This combination has proven powerful in attacking problems from algebraic geometry and statistical mechanics. Peter Sarnak, at the time his colleague at Princeton University, said, I would characterize Okunkov as being very powerful, sophisticated, and fast thinker who also has a great combinatorial talent and problem-solving skills. This combination is rather unusual. Andre is currently the Samuel Ellenberg Professor of Mathematics at Columbia University and the academic supervisor of the Higher School of Economics International Laboratory of Representation Theory and Mathematical Physics in Moscow. Previously, he held the positions of uh, Dixon Instructor in Mathematics at the University of Chicago, Professor of Mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley, and William S. Todd, Professor of Mathematics at Princeton University. His career uh, has had, he has had, uh, this, uh, in his distinguished career, received many distinctions. He was a Sloan Fellow in 2000, a Packer Fellow in 2001, won the European Mathematical Society Prize in 2004, the Fields Medal, as we said, in 2006, Composition Prize in 2009, and in 2012 was elected to the National Academy of Science of the USA, and in 2016 he became a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So I leave you now with Andre, who will tell us about the algebras for the 21st century. I think is that can you hear me better now? Right. So um, it's it's a uh, it's a great like a, I think it's very exciting to be in this walls that uh, that nurtured such a spectacular mathematical talent and and uh, and maybe the situ maybe the situation is a little bit the situation but here we, of course very strongly reminds me of the situation in mathematics in my in my native country, Russia, where um, also gave the world a lot of, of the most brilliant mathematicians, and yet so much can be done to improve the situation in, in, in mathematics and research and education. And um, and I'm very happy to be here in, in Buenos Aires on a very happy occasion for uh, for mathematics, namely um, as a part of the uh, as one of the guests at uh, at this uh, really moving ceremony yesterday when uh, recognition of um, two of your colleagues with the Bunchen Born Prize. And my, uh, my heartfelt congratulations to both Victor and Pablo for uh, this wonderful distinction. But I think it's also uh, a distinction for all of Argentinian mathematics. That's, uh, that's uh, I am really grateful for uh, to the foundation Bunchen Born for bringing mathematics uh, in the spotlight and somehow um, uh, focusing the Focusing public attention and attention of uh, all all 
people concern, both on the uh, on the great successes and, uh, and and highlights of Argentinian mathematics, and also what on things that, that could could really be improved. And, and I'm I'm very happy to be to be part of that. I'm really grateful to the foundation for for doing what what they what what, what they've been doing. So um, so now maybe you can go to the actual talk. And, um, Will be, I think, here. Right, so. This is, I admit this is a slightly provocative title. It's not, uh, I'm not, this is, I'm not here to, uh, I'm not here to, uh, I'm not here to claim the territory. I'm here to uh, maybe get you, get you curious, get you interested about, about um, new frontiers that Lee Theory is uh, exploring in the 21st century. Maybe before we, um, before we go to what's on the research in mind now, well, let's let's I'll I'll, I'll now I apologize to my colleagues who've been trained in Lee theory, but it's uh, maybe there's some people who don't know the definition of a Lee group, and this definition is very simple. A Lee group is a is a, is both a group. A group is a is a set of operations such as uh, that uh, have a product and and and, and an inverse that is like with natural axiom. It also manifolds. So it's, if, it's, if something is both a manifold and a group, such that the group operations are given by differentiable functions, this is called the Lie group. And this is a very simple idea. It turned out to be extremely, extremely productive. Well, if you do, if you, if you want to cross, if you want to look at the intersection of two sets, well, you don't know ahead of time that this will be a very fruitful domain. But in fact, in this case, the intersection of geometry in, uh, as represented by the very simple, very basic notion of a manifold, in the section of algebra is represented by its simplest notion, that of a group, is to be a very, very, very uh, fertile subject. And uh, as an example, one can take, in fact, all one-dimensional manifolds are Lie groups. So there are two one-dimensional manifolds. There is the real line. And of course, the real line is a group by just addition of numbers, and the, the, uh, the neutral element being zero. And also, the another one-dimensional manifold is a circle, and the circle is uh, is also Lie group. Well, you can take maybe you can abstractly view it as uh, as the quotient of real lines. So, if I take if I have a if I look at the reals and identify all integers, and I, I glue zero back to one, one back to zero, and, and somehow wrap it around the circle, then I get this this this, this map that wraps the line around the circle that says Abstracted the um, if I uh, if I have a Lie group and a discrete subgroup and the quotient is discrete normal subgroup and the quotient is again Lie group. Uh, so also you can view it as the group operation as uh, the group of complex numbers with absolute value one. So all all one-dimensional manifolds are in fact Lie groups. So um, as another example, there are matrix groups. So there is another very important uh, set of um, of set examples in Lie theory given by various metric groups, such as if I take two by two unitary matrices, two by two unitary matrices, I can explicitly parameterize as uh, by by um, two complex numbers a and b, like in like in this picture here, and the fact that this is the determinant one condition was going to give me will give me the condition that absolute value a squared plus absolute value b squared equals to one, and uh, and if I write it down in real coordinates, I see that this is a a three-dimensional sphere in the standard in basic and a four-dimensional space. So it's a, it's obviously ma this the unitary two by two matrices form a manifold. The manifold is three sphere, and the obvious it's just a group. So it's an example of a Lie group. Then um, the uh, so as we saw, so in this transparency, all one-dimensional manifolds are Lie groups. But as soon as we start with two-dimensional manifolds, we realize that very few, very few manifolds can be groups. Like if we look at two-dimensional orientable manifolds, 
there's a simple classification that teacher assumes that the two-dimensional orientable manifold, compact orientable, they classify by the number of handles. They start with a sphere, then there comes a donut, and then there's a pretzel, and so on and so forth. So uh, only one of them is a Lie group. Namely, if I take the torus, it's a product of a circle and a circle, and the pro direct product of two Lie groups is a Lie group. But uh, no, no. If I have, if I have no holes, or I have two or more holes, that's not a Lie group. And it's a very simple argument for this. Namely, namely, uh, a group, just just left or right multiplication by an element of the group, makes a group act on itself. And this means the group acts on, the, now the group is a manifold, and it acts on itself by, uh, by left or right translation. And this action is simply transitive, namely, there is one and only way to take to take the identity to any element of the group, that's the right multiplication or left multiplication by that element of the group. And so if I pick a basis of tangent vectors in at the, at the neutral element of the group by the identity of the group, then I can just transport that basis to to everywhere, spread this basis over the whole group. And so this, says, this shows that in what if I have a basis of tangent vectors on the whole manifold, this is this means the tangent bundle is trivial. But uh, so this very few, very few manifolds have tangent bundle trivial, namely any, if I have a two-dimensional surface which is not of genus one, then, uh, then, then that surface would not have, would not have a basis of not tangent vector. In fact, it's impossible to find one vector field which is not, not, not two, but even one is already impossible. And this is as illustrated by, uh, by the famous uh, problem of combing the, the, uh, I don't know what you call this animal here. In, in, uh, you don't have such, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, maybe porcupine, yeah. So, this is, um, so, uh, so this is, we've, uh, so this is maybe makes us realize that the Lie groups are, are sparse among manifolds and uh, maybe look at other ways we can think of, of Lie groups and in, in, important, in, uh, important operation is that if I look at this, um, if I two by two unitary matrices, they've given by um, by equations, they're, they're two complex variables A and B, but also the complex conjugate. And then uh, once I see an equation with variables and complex conjugates, then I can complexify, namely declare complex conjugates to be independent, and then um, from so B, declare A bar to be some new variable C, and then uh, this. This this takes a, a real Lie group, which was uh, this, which was the uh, this two by two unitary matrices, uh, two by two special unitary group, but then uh, it makes it uh, it makes a complex Lie group, which is which is in this case it's just all two by two matrices the determinant one, it's called the special linear special linear groups in two dimensions, and and the uh, Complex Lie groups that are obtained by the separation from uh, compact Lie groups are very special from many respects, and they called um, they called reductive. So also, a very closely related notion, semisimple. So these are these are uh, uh, in fact, as a manifold, uh, this is something. This is on the side. As a manifold, it's always the case that the a, 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 any Lie group is a uh, has the same topology as its maximal compact subgroup K, and the rest is uh, is just a is just a flat space with a certain dimension. And this uh, an example this this is the example very familiar to you is if I take non-zero complex numbers, then uh, bipolar by uh, polar coordinates this is the same as so to have two polar coordinates namely the radius and the uh, and the and the angle, and so the topology radius is uh, just a trivial factor of R. And the angle has is the topology is where that all the topology sits, and the uh, non and, and a higher rank analog of that. If I take non GLN, that is to say, n by n matrices determined non-zero, then then there is an analog. There's a polar decomposition. Every such matrix you can write as a unitary times a positive definite permission matrix, and positive definite permission matrix that's a that's a as a ma as, as a manifold. That's just that's just Rn, just well, not Rn to a certain power. I mean, R to a certain power. So there's some, um, there's uh, the main, the main examples of Lie groups. Uh, one can look at them in inside the matrix group, and in addition to unit, so there's unitary matrices. There's also, 
there's also orthogonal matrices, the rotations of the n-dimensional Euclidean space. And there's one more class of, one more important class is the, uh, so rotations are the, are the transformation that preserve, preserve distance, that is to say, a non-degenerate, uh, quadratic form, a positive definite quadratic form. Then you can similarly equip a vector space with a symplectic form and ask for transformation that preserve that. It will be a symplectic group, symplectic transformation, also a matrix with a group. Um, and this, the three groups uh, in their representation theory have been playing, has been playing a very important role in uh, not just in mathematics but all of natural sciences because uh, it's uh, I mean, like for example the early work of Herman Weil was, was very much interconnected with his study of mathematical issues in in, in, in quantum mechanics and well, you know, somehow if we, if we go the ideas of symmetries the gauge symmetry and so forth that that's one of the most most important unifying ideas in, in all of mathematical physics, in fact. And um, uh, what concerns compact or, um, or equivalent to semi-simple play groups, it's a remarkable mathematical fact that there is a complete classification. Namely, there are, well, it depends how you count, I have three or four infinite series. I'm, a, I'm more of a classical group person, so I take all orthogonal groups as being in one series. So there is this, uh, U, is a compact group would be the uh, they are the unitary, the orthogonals, and the and the corresponding symplectic analog, the three infinite series, and some sporadic examples. Anyway, there's a complete classification of all compact Lie groups. And this was done, in fact, by classics. Um, and there's uh, <coughs> there's it's a, something we teach our students now, and this is such a such a beautiful argument that they, it's it's always it's always a pleasure to recall it. So maybe I'll I'll, I'll say a few words how this has actually been done. This was done more than it was done in, by the classification was done by 1890, so a long, long time ago. Uh, and so this, there's a the classification. There's a beautiful logic to that. And there's a first step in that uh, you first reduce. So you start with a you start Lie group is a manifold with some group operation. So there is a uh, a very important ingredient there is a manifold. A manifold is some non-linear object. There's no, there's no, uh, <laughs> differential geometers know a lot about manifolds, but it's not like you can really go and classify, say, or four manifolds. That's a, probably a really hard problem. And, uh, whereas there's a first step that reduces the manifold part, some, some non-linear geometric thing to really Really, a linear object uh, to something called the Lie algebra. And what's the Lie algebra? Let's see if I. Okay. A Lie algebra, from the geometric viewpoint, it's just the tangents. It's just the tangent space to the group. The group is a manifold, and uh, uh, at every point it has a tangent space. And the Lie algebra is a vector space, just a tangent space at that entity to the to the uh, to the group. So it's not a very interesting geometric object. Algebraically, it's interesting to look what it's, what are the, what are the equations of this linear space that cut it out and say, say inside the matrices. Like, for example, if, if we're talking about unitary matrices, then, uh, unitary matrices are given by this equation. So if we, if we write u, what does it mean to have a tangent vector? We write, we write u of the form 1 plus some small number x, and we substitute u into this equation, we get, we're, we realize that the tangent vectors are given such that the Hermitian conjugate of x is minus x. So that says the tangent vector is, uh, is given by skewer emission matrices. The tangent vectors are given by skewer emission matrices. And okay, it's a, it's, it's a vector space nonetheless, not a very interesting geometric object. But this vector space, this vector space inherits, uh, a very important structure, uh, a Lie, what's called the Lie algebra structure, namely, we can't really multiply elements in this vector space, but what we, what we can do, we can take this group commutator. So a group commutator is a product of, you take two elements of the group and take the, their products and their inverses in the way that if they were commuting, that'd be one, but they're not commuting in general. So in general, this is a non-commutative group. And so if you expand this product, then you see that the, well, of course, we'll start with one. The linear terms will cancel just because, just because linear terms are insensitive to to uh, whether the group is con where it's commutative or not, so they will cancel. And the nonlinear terms will be this matrix. Well, if this is a matrix group, this will be a matrix commutator. 
And so it's this tangent space, geometrically trivial, it has an interesting algebraic structure, and then this bracket. And, and the one knows that, that in fact this bracket is enough that by solving certain differential equations, you can reconstruct the whole manifold just by knowing what this bracket is. So, so the complete knowledge of a Lie group as a manifold pro both the group structure and the manifold structure is, is encoded just in this, in this, just in this operation of the tangent space called the Lie algebra bracket. And it's, uh, this is, uh, this is some marvelous insight that goes back to Sophos Lee himself and how to reconstruct from this knowledge the whole, the entire, the entire information about the group. So, and then the second part of the classification is that how to classify Lie algebra. And these are now the ones that correspond to, uh, to compact or semi-simple groups or reductive groups, they, they, um, they're, they're again classified in a certain data which has both the geometric and combinatorial flavor, something called root systems. So these are, this, uh, but it's geometry of a different flavor. It's the geometry of the kind, this is a geometry of discrete reflection groups or, or finite reflection groups. And the way this goes is that one first starts one verse starts with a uh, Lie algebra. You look for the maximal, the maximal subspace on which which is commutative, on which this Lie algebra bracket vanishes. Like for example, if I take n by n matrices, then such subspace will be given by an example of such subspace is just given by all diagonal matrices. If I take diagonal matrices, then their commutator is zero, and uh, and moreover, there's this is a maximal such. If I add, so we will get to it in a second. If I add any any if I take all diagonal matrices and I take anything off diagonal, this will have this will have this 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 will start having non-zero commutators. So this is so, so in any in any Lie algebra there is an analog of like diagonal matrices here. And in fact in, in this um, in this classical series they in fact can be taken diagonal matrices. All the classic all the and so this is uh, this is an example. And then what you do, what roots are, so maybe for a missed what roots are, these are the, these are the eigenvectors of the operation. So if I have a, a commutative algebra and I, I take elements here and I commute with anything, this, I, this will be commuting operators and I can look for common eigenvectors. Like what is this for, what is it for, uh, for JLM? For JLM, if I look all diagonal matrices and I look for common op, for common eigenvectors of, of the commutator, then I have to take just, just, just matrix units. So if I take a, an element, matrix unit, something which is sits in i row and j column, and I take the commutator of diagonal matrices with this matrix unit, I will get I will get the matrix unit back times A i minus AJ. So it's a this one is a common eigenvector of all commutators. And the common eigenvalue, this one, this is record this is some linear form on my space. So it's an element, it's a distinguished it's a distinguished linear function on this n-dimensional space, and that's called the root. So this is, uh, this, this says that in this situation, for this uh, maximal community subalgebra called Cartan subalgebra, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have all, you know, for every i not equal to j, I'm gonna have a root, and this root is given by the linear function a i minus a j. And, and it turns out that in, in general, this, this root, Form, so this is a linear function, means it's an element, it's a vector in the dual space, and they, from the axioms of the algebra, they, they, they have some very, very special configuration of vectors, something, something one can go and combinatorially classify. And this is, and this is once you classify a root system, you classify a Lie algebra. So this is, this is how the classification goes. Um, so this is, uh, This is somebody made a projection of, I believe, E8 root system into three-dimensional space and built it from um, built it from um, from this uh, instruction set. Now, um, anytime humans are very, it's very difficult to humans to believe there's really an end of the story. Like there's some there's some wonderful story such as uh, the one of Three Musketeers or whatever, Harry Potter, you name it. And then uh, when it comes to the end, uh, you know, we always want to know <laughs> what happens next, what somehow, you know. 
<laughs> what was the what's the what what's the continuation? We, we like the characters and we can we don't want to well at least I hope those have taken uh certainly when I took a Lee theory class and I hope my students will take Lee class Lee theory class now when they're done with the classification of the algebra, maybe they feel you know, where is the what, what is you know, how can they contribute? I mean, what is that the problem? What's what's there left to do in this? And so uh, it's only human to look for um, for the um, for generalization, and of course, in the this classification we just discussed, that was done in 19th century, and in 20th century, of course, there was a lot, lot of progress in uh, in extending V theory to beyond beyond what we just described, and this mainly has to do with studying infinite infinite dimensional Lie algebras, infinite dimensional Lie groups, and the various flavors of them. And uh, these are these are very important, but um, uh, but it also be fair to say that this is this is you um, uh, this still follows the basic paradigm is the same. The only difference is that instead of a finite dimensional manifold, you have to say what's an infinite dimensional manifold. Or instead of a finite dimensional Lie algebra, you have to say what class of infinite dimensional algebras do you uh, allow. Whether this is what I'm going to talk now is 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 goes in a slightly different direction. It's not it's not strictly speaking Lie algebra, but it's something which is from many perspectives as good as Lie algebra. Um, so um, and this is um, this is a confluence of two things. And uh, first, it requires a, a slightly more geometric viewpoint of what a Lie algebra is, and it also um, and it also uh, really um, Interact. It's kind of really basic physical intuition, namely the. Uh, you know, if you uh, open a basic physics textbook, uh, the, you certainly will get the feeling that uh, that the simplest possible, all the simplest possible commutation relations, when when the then the uh, momentum and position the commutator is, is a constant, or maybe they set their constant to one. That's the mother of all things on commutative. And in fact, so maybe you know we'll get to that in a second. There's some history to to that, and we'll we'll get to that later. And so, uh, how do we? What sort of geometric, more geometric viewpoint I uh, I want to take is that. Uh, uh, so we already discussed that the Lie group always acts on itself by uh, say right or left multiplication, and uh, it will also act on 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 a homogeneous space. So if I take a quotient. A quotient of G by uh, by a Lie subgroup. So a Lie subgroup is a submanifold, which is also a subgroup, and uh, it's a basic theorem in, in Lie. It's a basic theorem in Lie theory that any any quotient by such uh, subgroup, any coset of such subgroup, is again a manifold. And so there's a group on a manifold X of this form. A group will act by uh, by right multiplication or left. Sorry, this the way it's written. <laughs> The way it's written the left, for confusing for left and right. And um, so, for example, if I take uh, such an example, for example, the sphere, the three sphere, and uh, obviously the rotation of S of three, the rotation of three dimensional space act on it. And uh, what's this? So, so, in this language, G is an orbit, it's a group that acts, and H is a stabilizer of a point. Uh, so, or a, or a stabilizer of any point will be subgroup conjugate to H. And uh, so a stabilizer, so if I take a three sphere and the rotation action of this three sphere, there's a stabilizer of a point, say, say of a nurse pole, that will be just rotation in, two, in the perpendicular two dimensional plane. So uh, my three sphere is a quotient by S of SO3 by SO2. Um, and this is, um, this is an example, in fact, of, uh, of, a, of a quotient of a compact group by a maximal commutative subgroup. So in this case, if I take rotation in, in three space, then, uh, then this, uh, this the maximal commutative subgroup that would be rotation which pre around a ro rotation about a given axis, so like S O two and S O three. And uh, and another example, more general example, if I take all unitary matrices, then uh, and then I take the diagonal ones, it's a maximal commutative subgroup. And so then this quotient abstractly, if you think what's that quotient? So if I take they all unitary matrices by diagonal ones. These are just, these are just 
This is the same. Well, if I unitary matrices act on Hermitian matrices by conjugation, and you can bring any Hermitian matrix by unitary conjugation to diagonal form, and such a, a diagonal matrix is preserved exactly by diagonal matrices. So the, 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 the manifold K mod T for unitary matrices would, you can think of this as a manifold of, of, uh, uh, of Hermitian matrices with six distinct eigenvalues. This is an analog of a sphere if you want. And uh, a, general, a general principle is that such a quotient is always, in fact, a complex manifold. The fact that this, this three-dimensional sphere is also the Riemann sphere, that's not accidental. And the reason you prove, in the way you prove it, is that um, by, from abstract grounds, this, this K mod T is the same as you take the complexification, and you mod out by what's called the Borel subgroup, which is for GLN. So this, 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 if I take all unitary modular diagonal, it's the same if I take all complex matrices and I mod out by upper triangles. This is, this is an example you can easily do it. It's, uh, So and um, and so my complex Lie group, my complex Lie group, since since my my space X, which is this, the, the space it's called it also has has a name in Lie called the flag variety. So X is this quotient by compact by max by but by a torus or a complex by Borel subgroup, which is a generalization of upper triangular matrices. So the group. The group, if a group acts on a manifold, then, uh, then the, Lie, then the Lie algebra would, so if I have a Lie algebra, an element in Lie algebra is an infinitesimal element of a group, and if I have a, a group of diffeomorphism, something that acts on a manifold, then, uh, then an infinitesimal diffeomorphism is a vector field. So the Lie algebra is going to act by vector fields on my X. And in fact, this, the Lie algebra is the same as all holomorphic vector fields. It's just you can you can um, there's there's you can you can you can get you can get your Lie algebra back and and you can get the, the all of all of its uh, all of its operations because you have uh, if you uh, if you think of an element of Lie algebra with holomorphic vector field then the commutator the Lie, Lie bracket the commutator in Lie algebra well it's just a bracket of vector fields as we teach in, in calculus so. You can get your Lie algebra back as as the set of all holomorphic vector fields on a certain complex manifold. So that's up. Um, and so let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, somehow talk more about it. And so, for example, so this if I take if I go back to my um, to my example with with two sphere or the Riemann sphere, which is uh, uh, which is you know, one way to write it down is is the SL2, which is uh, modular all upper triangular matrices. This is complex group modular the Borel. And so then uh, this is my Riemann sphere. I can coordinateize it with a complex coordinate Z, and then the, the, the coordinate infinity would be uh, 1 over Z. And then this is, if I if I am interested in all holomorphic vector fields, there are just three of them. So it's, it's very easy to convince ourselves that the space of holomorphic vector fields is three-dimensional. And this corresponds, and this corresponds to the action of the three standard generators of my Lie algebra So this is a, so, um, this, uh, uh, a very important notion in, 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 in Lie theory is that of a uh, universal developing algebra, that is just the algebra which is uh, it's an algebra generated by the Lie algebra with relation being the commutator in the Lie algebra. And again, this, this here, it has, uh, again, a very transparent geometric meaning, namely, this, uh, the, the vector fields are just differential operators of order one, and you can ask for, uh, and you can ask for all holomorphic differential operators. So, there's no, there's no differential operators, there's no differential operators of order zero, for example, other than constants, because differential operator of order zero is a function. But I have a compact complex manifold, there's no functions on it which are other than, other than the, other than the constant function. But I have vector fields, so I decided vector fields are, are my Lie algebra. 
But then if I have vector fields, I can, I can well, this, this being differential operators for the one, I can, I can multiply them and get differential operators of higher order that will form, this will form the um, analogy pro with relations which are, of course, the commutator of them is given the bracket. That's the, that's what the, this is, this is the definition of a commutator of two vector fields and this is the definition of, of my Lie algebra and it says that they, they agree. And also any, 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 any central element will in fact be equal to a constant. So there will be no, there's no, Casimir element is some, uh, is, a, is a differential operator that commutes with everybody. But sorry, anything, it, or any, any, any element you can build from size and needs that commutes with everybody, they'll tell you can take on. This is called a, in this theory, it'll be called the central reduction of, of, of universal delta culture, which is an object as good as, uh, as, as my group or, or the Lee algebra. And so, and so this is, um, the conclusion is that this, this main object, this, uh, this universal valent algebra U, which is the algebra generated by my Lie algebra. Well, what this really is from the, uh, from the physics perspective, that's really just a holomorphic quantization of, 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 um, of the cotangent bundle to my G mod D, cotangent bundle to the flag variety. So, uh, so if I look at the, in other words, if, if I have a, uh, in, in classical mechanics, I have a, uh, I have a coordinates and momenta, and these are coordinates on the cotangent bundle. And then uh, in, uh, in quantum mechanics, these are promoted to differential operators. So all I did is I, I took all differential operators on a certain, on a certain manifold that would be a, a that would be a standard quantization. Well, in this case, holomorphic quantization. I took holomorphic differential operators. Of, of this uh, cotangent bundle to my flag variety. And, uh, and this is, uh, so if I want the, if I want my classical story about the theory, then what I need to do is I look at this manifold of the form G mod B, and I get my Lee theory by this, by this very standard quantization procedure from them. And then this brings then a question, which other, so if, if this is, uh, if this is, uh, if this is what geometrically produces Lie algebras, then you can ask which other holomorphic symplectic manifolds are are exact same kinds of the same kind as this G mod D. So this is so maybe this uh, I'll pause for a second here. So the, again, the question is: you start with the you start with a compact or or, or reductive Lie group. And then associated to them is a, is a, is a very special manifold, which is for like an analog of a sphere of Riemann sphere, in general called flag manifold. And, and then all you're doing is you're just writing, you're, you're getting back your Lie algebra, you're getting, getting back your Lie group from just differential operator on this manifold. The differential operators on the, on the manifold, this is, this is an example of going from a symplectic manifold such as cotangent bundle, to uh, a non-commutative algebra, namely uh, a quantization of that symplectic manifold. So then you can ask which other holomorphic symplectic manifolds are like this cotangent bundle to, to the flag variety. And there's a, there is a, a technical, so this will be a little, yeah. okay, math, uh, in math it has to get a little bit technical at some point, so, but that's, uh, and this is, um, this has to do with the structure. So this is the, there's a, a technical point, which is very important. So I'll try my best to describe it in some non-technical terms. And it has to do with the structure of things before the quantization. So if I, quantization, so, so, um, the quantization is going from, uh, a commutative algebra to a non-commutative algebra. We start with holomorphic functions on, on some symplectic manifold. So this is if I, or cotangent bundle to a flag variety, that would be the holomorphic functions. Our, our um, local holomorphic functions are just coordinates and momentum, and global holomorphic functions, whatever they are. And so there's something, there's some technical property about this commutative algebra that, uh, that this deformation, that is important for this deformation being, being good. And so let's again, let's again talk about uh, the simplest case, Riemann sphere. 
And uh, again, the, the Riemann sphere, okay, that's the Riemann sphere with its coordinate z. And then, uh, and then there is a, 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 the corresponding t star direction, let's call that coordinate p. So, um, and then we ask which are the which are the global, which are the on this t star, on this t star of my Riemann sphere, cotangent to the Riemann sphere. You can ask which are the global, which are the global functions. And it's very easy to convince ourselves that the so this is we already already claimed that there's only three, three um, that all holomorphic differential operators are in fact generated by three holomorphic vector fields. Namely, d by dz, z d by dz, and z squared is d by dz. Then corresponding functions are just p, z times p, and z time, and z squared times p. And in fact, it's easy to see that in fact this this these three functions generate all possible all possible um, all possible holomorphic functions with t star p1. And if I look at the image of this map, what is if I have a, a large break variety? And I have three functions. That means that means I have a map from my algebraic variety to a three state. And of course, the image of that map will be a cone. And then it, because this this function in the middle squared is the product of the two things outside. If I take this function and then square it, it's the same as f one of times f minus one. So the image of that will be a quadric cone. If f not squared equals f minus one times f one. So I have a and and, and the way this map goes is that the cotangent fibers go to the rulings of this cone, and this whole Riemann sphere will get collapsed to a point here. Well, it has to, because if I look at the Riemann sphere, that certainly has no global holomorphic functions. So if I look at, at an image given by any kind of function, that has to go to a point. So that, 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 Riemann, that yellow sphere here will be collapsed to this, this, ap this apex of the cone. And the, the technical property that this map satisfies. So have, again, so again, I have a picture. So this is my Riemann sphere. This reads the sphere itself. This the yellow sphere itself has collapsed to this yellow point here. And the different fibers, the different potential fibers, they go to the different lines that go through the vertex of this cone. And this satisfies a very, two very crucial properties. I mean, this satisfies one property that algebraic geometry is called, it's a resolution of singularity. This, this one property of being resolution singularities, this, this, um, this is actually confluence of two things. One, one property is that the, every fiber of this map is compact. So the fiber here, if I look at the, if I look at this any point in the target, what I have over it is either a point or, or, or my sphere. So it, it, it's a proper map. It means every fiber of that is compact. Uh, and uh, and the second property is that a generic fiber is in fact a point. So this is a map that is so resolution singularity is a map that is uh, birational. So this means generic it's an isomorphism to an open set, and uh, and then every fiber is compact. So this is this is this the the key properties. So these are these are this is in fact. And this property is also enjoyed by, so this is the analog of that for a general, for a general, for a general compact or semi-simple Lie group, but this picture will be the following. This will be, this, this yellow thing is my flag variety, and this, these are the cotangent, the cotangent bundle of my flag variety. And the analog of the quadric cone is the cone of nilpotent elements in the corresponding Lie algebra. So this T star G mod B is the resolution of singularities of the cone of nilpotent so if I look at nilpotent elements in some Lie algebra, that's some at some cone. Generally they're singular, more singular than the cone here. It's it's a cone because if I have a nilpotent element, if I have a nilpotent matrix, I multiply it by a number, it's still nilpotent matrix. So it's a, it's a it's always a cone. Uh, and for two by two trace zero matrices, the, the condition that are nilpotent is exactly the quadric cone condition. So, um, and so many people think that this is the, um, so this is, did I, did I make this definition here? Okay, maybe, somehow, all right, let's, let, let's, let's stay on this transparency and make this definition. 
So a symplectic, a symplectic, a holomorphic symplectic manifold is called symplectic resolution. If, if I look at its global functions, this will be a map. This the global functions it will give me a map to some vector space, and the and this map should be resolution singular, namely it's a proper and by rational. I mean it's a, it's fibers are compact and generic fiber is uh, is uh, is a point. And so now on this next transparency, I'm cutting some corners and I say that um, well no no I'm not cutting it. Just saying the there's there's a there's a world out there uh, in which certainly there is a big archipelago or I mean a consonant. So we start so there we, there we have a we have a consonant of Lie group the algebra and then there is a next there's a bridge to the next place which is called symplectic resolutions. These are these are quantizations of this very special symplectic algebraic varieties. It's um it's not the end of the world. Already from there, from this equivalence, from this symplectic resolution, we already can see some other lands. It's not, this is not the end of the world. There's somehow more objects of kind of the same flavor, but, uh, that would be some required generalization of definition I just gave. So let's, let's not, let's not try to do it because this is already interesting enough. And, uh, so, so this, in particular, this is a very rich theory that has many examples. We'll get, we'll get, my next goal is to get to them. And uh, it has also a new, since, uh, since in Lee theory there was a crucial notion of a certain crucial combinatorics of these roots and, and core roots and so forth. Uh, this is, this has this combinatorics. Actually, I'm going to curiously, this, uh, in this, in this world, roots and core roots are really different. Like, for example, they can sit in lattice of different rank. Because, well, well maybe we'll, maybe I'll say it. I mean, they don't sit, they don't sit on the space of the same rank. So if I, and then, and, in the analog of like Langlands duals that permutes roots and core roots, that's really kind of dramatic, dramatic transformation that, uh, that uh, exchanges lattices of different rank, exchanges objects of different rank. So, but let's, let's talk about examples. And let, I apologize, you've all grown tired of this cone thing, but let's, let's go back to this cone. And so the cone, again, this is, this is, this was, this is the image of this three function f. That satisfy the condition that f minus one times f one equals f not squared. And one way you can, so we, we, we've seen it as an, we've seen it as an image of, uh, uh, you take T star of a sphere, you collapse, you collapse the central fiber, you get this cone. Uh, but you can also see it differently. You can see, look at this, look at the plane with coordinates x1 and x2. And uh, consider the transformation of that plane, which is just reflection about the origin. So it just sends x to minus x. And then this, this transformation will have exactly three invariant functions, namely x1 squared. And every function invariant under this transformation is generated by this three, namely if I take x1 squared, f2 squared, and the product of x's, these generate all functions that are invariant with the, under x going to minus x. And so, and so this, this cone, I can view, you know, I can view it as, I mean, like I said, we previously viewed it as an image of T star of a sphere, but we can also view it as an image of C2 under the map that identifies, that identifies, uh, X and minus X. So this map, this map is not a resolution singularity. This map is generally 2 to 1, right? So if, I, if I take X and minus X, so this is, the, the fibers of that map are, this map is generally the two to one. It's not a resolution singularity. It's a quotient by a finite group. And so maybe a better way to think about this quotient, we can look, we can look at, um, a pair of points in the plane and, and look at, uh, an operation that permutes them. I have a pair of points in the plane. Uh, the, the, tra the permutation of two points will not going to change their center of mass. So maybe we m make them Make the center of mass at zero. So this is, so if I take pairs of points and may make the center of mass at zero, then the permutation is the same as taking x to minus x. And so this is really, uh, this, 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 uh, this cone singularity is really the singularity if you take two points in the plane and you permute them. That's, uh, so that quotient would be, well, the center of mass will be a, 
will be just a just a new coordinate c, and then the interesting part of that, the interesting part of that permutation will, will give this cone singularity. And then so, and then you can think about the resolution. So, how you think geometrically about this this resolution in these terms? So, how you in this language, how do we reconstruct this map? Uh, well, let's see. So you have a pair of points. Let's let's think about all polynomials that vanish at these two points. Namely, let's algebraic geometry will say let's look about let's think about the ideal defined by this pair of points. So if I pair of points, then uh, what are the polynomials that vanish there? Well, first of all, they, there is a there is a line. So, so this is if if we are already assume the the points. Let's assume the center of mass is already at zero, so this line will be the line through the origin. Okay, if I have, I have uh, two points, then there's a, they both lie on the line that goes through the origin. So this is, this is some polynomial that vanishes on this pair of points. And that the variety of all these lines, well, let's just, so then not, all lines that go through an origin define a projective space of one small dimension. So this is, these lines define for me exactly the Riemann sphere. And then once I fix the line, then there, so I have two points on the line. I have an additional quadratic equation satisfied by these two points. And so these quadratic equations for given, for, for this, for, uh, for given, so the line itself defines a point on the Riemann sphere. And the quadratic equations that these two points on the line satisfy, this will be, this will be the fiber of the, of this map. So this the way the way to think of this map geometrically again if you you start with a you start with a pair of points and you look at think about the corresponding ID all polynomials that vanish at this two points this will be a non this will be a smooth algebraic variety and in fact as I explained to you it will be just C star of of a, of P1 of, of C star of Riemann sphere in this case and so once we did this then you can do it the same for the same thing for n points so so this is if I have an unordered collection of n points in the plane, this is uh, this is this is a quotient, this is a quotient by symmetric group of the symmetric group of n permuting n elements. But I can there's a remarkable resolution of that space, given by I look at the at the corresponding I polynomials that vanish at this n tuple point. This is this is the this is this is the uh, this will be an ideal. Uh, Ideal in the ring of polynomials in two variables of co-dimension n, because if I, if I have n points, then the, uh, then, uh, if I take all polynomials and I mod out by everything that vanishes, I get all functions, but all functions on the set of n points is an n-dimensional space. So I'm using something of co-dimension n, and this is called the Hilbert scheme of points, and this is, this is a, this is an example of symplectic resolution which is not of the form previously discussed. Which is a remarkable algebraic symplectic variety, and uh, but it's not of the form previously discussed. It's not a cotangent bundle to anything. Uh, and uh, and a new feature you see that if you look at the if you think of what the roots of that are, so for for um, for n equals for n equals two, we had uh, well modulo the center of mass which we you know, take out. Well, we we took it out. So this would be the flag variety for SL2. And for SL2, you know, there is one root, which is in certain natural normalization is two. Then, then uh, so, but the whole Hill scheme of endpoint, there is, there is this guy, there's this one, which is like for one, which is like the center of mass. But in fact, then there'll be, there'll be two, three, and so forth up to N. So in particular, there will be, there are roots that are so in ordinary Lie theory, we teach our students that if I have a root in Lie algebra, then twice this root, no multiple of that root is a root. But here, in this, in this, once you relax the definition, you see that you get, you get a situation when root, where you can have root be multiple of one another. That's a, this is, this is one of the features that you, you see, uh, in this case. And then, uh, you can, uh, there's this, it's, it's well known what's, uh, what's the, if I look at the, at the quantization, namely, so this is the holomorphic complexity variety, 
and there's a there's a general theory of how to quantize or I mean how to non commutatively deform their algebras or functions, and and this, it's well known that in this particular instance I get something which Lee theorists already studied. They they studied it in for reasons of kind of internal logic of the subject, not because they were they were uh, they were uh, following some you know, following guidelines of certain definitions, but certainly it's an object not new to Lee theory. There are many through this window you get many objects generally new to Lee theory, but this one isn't that has been studied before. Something called a Chernik algebra. And then this already, I mean, this, this object already has found, uh, uh, this object already has found many applications in, in IT. Yeah, somehow there's, uh, there's whole conferences and our symposia on this Chernik algebra and people did, people find their applications everywhere, including, including probability theory and all this. But here, anyway, this is already is an integral part of, of modern Lee theory. And that's, uh, that certainly is a, uh, certainly a good sign that it's the first example of uh, of something which is some new object. We find this, but like I said, there, there, there's okay. That's my 50 minutes, uh, and uh, now I uh, I got the last slide. Then. So that's uh, but thank you so much for, for your time. Right, so um, so uh, so classically, what's a, a root? A root is um, I, so a root I define. Root is you you look at the uh, at the eigenvalue. of this community algebra A acting maybe this acting on um, on the real algebra G. And so but this is this now if we if we look at this space X then then there will be um, the analog of, of this would be you have you will have inside of Symplectic automorphisms. So, if I look at inside of symplectic automorphisms of X, you will have a, there will be a torus which is an analog. So this is this is like in Lie algebra. This is in, uh, and then you look at the, you can look at the group or, or you can or you can look at here. So there will be a commutative sub maximal commutative subalgebra of I guess it's um, in the Lie algebra of automorphism. So look at the Lie algebra of the automorphism, there'll be a maximal commutative subalgebra. And then it will have it will have some fixed points. So. And then we'll have some eigenvalues acting in the normal in the normal bundle. So this fixed point. So if you look at the normal bundle the fixed point, that this will have some eigenvalues acting there, and these are the roots. So this is just direct analog. So if you apply this for uh, for two sides of mod B, you're just going to get this. And so for um, for um, for the Hilbert Hume points, it's a question. Then the uh, so for the Hilbert Hume point, point, then uh, then then in fact the the symplectical inside of symplectical automorphism, you get just the ordinary SL2. Inside of the complex automorphism, right? And then inside here, that you have the ordinary, ordinary maximal the subalgebra. And and then it's a question of how does this algebra acts at the tangent spaces of these six points? And this is given by uh, the description is given by this kind of hook length. And from this description, you see that you get you get ways which are a, two a, three a, up to n a. And then the chorus is something slightly different. So chorus are the so classically chorus have to do with maps from SL2, like you have a like a map from 
maybe call it P alpha, into uh, into uh, into your group G. So now if I go to G mod V, if I mod out by the action of V, then I'm going to get the map from just three months here, P1, into G mod V. So in other words, core roots have to do with certain rational curves in here. Some, some data which is a priori very different from this. And so there's, there's a, there's a certain special rational curves in this, in this X, which somehow this, this, <coughs> this, this Lie algebra knows very little about rational curves. In particular, this somehow core root, core root practice sits in H2 of X. So this is, this is what the core root lattice is. And this, the rank of this lattice have nothing to do with the rank of, I mean, generally has nothing to do with the rank of, of the two. Well, I mean, the, like Chernik algebras or, or, or in yeah. general? Well, Chernik algebras, they've, uh, these are the things that control McDonald's polynomials and people, these are the things that algebraically control McDonald's polynomials and people, Applied McDonald polynomials to like everything, and like Fernando likes McDonald polynomials. Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, you count you count points in algebraic variety or finite field. You find McDonald polynomials. You do whatever random random gross processes. You find McDonald polynomials. You study Havana not invariance. You find McDonald polynomials. Now it's a, it's, a, it's a big it's a big subject. I mean, in some sense, so this is the the uh, this. In terms of special functions, and, and of course, the dearest to me are enumerative applications. So you come, the dearest to me is, 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 is this kind of part, is that, is that this, uh, the Lee theory has to do with certain rational curves somewhere. And so this is, there's some, there's some, um, enumerative theory application, like if you, if you, if you correctly, if you, there's a way to, to, uh, there's a way to count curves in this variety so that we'll find the corresponding special function. Mm -hmm. Right. So the main, the main thing. So this, I was very happy you, uh, you guys had this, this picture from the ICM, and uh, is um, because what was in the picture from the ICM? The picture from the ICM had uh, like an astronaut uh, floating behind me, and uh, this astronaut was meant to represent the Zurkovnikov. who taught me that in this new world you don't need the value. You have, so this root, so well, how is it going to go? So this means you have some collection of roots. So let's see, you have a, um, well, let's, let's do it for the, let's do it for the Hilbert scheme. So you have a, so for the Hilbert scheme, the roots are, um, so again, for uh, X, so till then, the roots are one, two, three, up to N. Let, let's see what this means. So this is, um, so in general, the, the analog of, so to speak, if I have a, if I have like something like my Cartan subalgebra, then this is, this is, we will come to this example in a second. So the, the right analog of what, what a Lee theorist normally would write is, is an analog of a fine root system. You look at all possible hyperplanes of the form, we'll just, of the form where so if you have a coordinate h, and what do you do? You have a linear form alpha of your element h, and you'd like this to be an integer. Okay. So this is this is if you do it for a classical root system, you find a Scott Moody affine reflection group, and it was very important in the in the classical development that. That in fact this, this oscillation you find is um, is very symmetric. Namely, there is a group of symmetries that takes every alcof of this oscillation to any other alcof. So this is this, this is fact. So this is this oscillation is is are the are the reflection hyperplanes of a certain discrete group generated by reflection. But now, but now in this new world, what's it going to be? So let's say for the Hilbert scheme of points again. So this are this is my equation. The equation says that one of these linear forms evaluated on my vector takes an integer value. So this means 
Well, if I look at the first linear form, I'm getting all integers, so I'm getting one to minus one. Then I take a two, then I also get one half. Then I'm getting three, I'm also getting one third and two thirds. And so forth, I'm getting all numbers of the form A over B, where B is at most N. This is a very important arrangement of hyperplane in mathematics in general, but it's certainly not symmetric. It has, it has some symmetry. It has, it has a translational symmetry. Any, any, any arrangement of this form will have a translational symmetry. And it has a reflection symmetry, but it doesn't have enough symmetry to, uh, to take uh, every, every alcove to any other alcove. In fact, all alcoves are kind of, all alcoves are pretty much different. And that's, this is, uh, in, in, in this sort of new, new, in this kind of least theory, it's, 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 it's a slightly different paradigm. It's, it's saying that the, it's saying that the, um, you know, different alcoves of, of a certain, of a certain, uh, of this arrangement, uh, they're really different. In, in particular, you see it like this. So there's, um, for this algebra, there's analog of um, cardinal lustig theory. And this is why, I mean, why, why one of the claims of this algebra to be as good as, um, as Lie algebra is that they possess a, an analog of cardinal lustig theory. In fact, the analog of cardinal lustig theory in characteristic P. So this is, you can, you, you can describe a reducible representation in characteristic P in some terms resembling the cardinal lustig theory. And unusual cardinal lustig theory, you have the Heike algebra that uh, somehow comes from this reflection group. But here, you, you have, all you have is some kind of, some kind of wall crossing type of operator. And these operators are not, I mean, representation theory here and representation here is really different. It's not, here's some categories, here's some other category. And, and what this guy is, is some derived equivalent between certain module categories. It's not, it's not, it's just really, as a billion category, it's really different. And so this is, um, so this is, uh, it's not, I mean, it just is, just fact of nature, that this, 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 uh, the, the complete symmetry of everything with respect to our group is just, is just somehow, for better or worse, is long. But it's a, so in this transparency form, I don't know. You can, you can look at the, you can look at the pictures from the ICM talk. It's there. Just go to my home web page and just go ICM.pdf. Yeah, for this file, you'll see this whole thing. Because maybe the main message there is that you can live without the wild group. And, uh, but, the first step without the wild group was illustrated by, by this uh, kind of spacewalk. Yeah, so that's uh, Okay, I apologize. It was probably too long an answer. But. Just saying.